Hi, everybody. This is Kathleen from GGP Books, and um, I am super excited tonight. Um, I get to introduce you to two of my favorite writers. Um, Jill Santapalo has written some amazing books, but for those of you who don't know, she's also an editor at Penguin Random House Young Readers, and she is Chelsea Clinton's editor, which is, I think is very cool. <laughs> so cool. Um, but this book is really special. Um, it's called Everything After, and I've got it right here. That's why I was a little late. I had to find it. Um, it is one of the most beautiful love stories, and it's got music woven in, and it's got poetry. It's got just about everything that I love in a book. And Jill has a way with people that nobody else, I, I think. And, and she does make you ugly cry. So be prepared. And um, I am super excited. I get to introduce you to my good friend, Jandy Delson, which I know you've seen her at the store a lot. Um, she is the Prince Award winning author of I'll, um, I'll Give You the Sun. And I'm sure soon there will be another book because I've, 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 I've heard at least one chapter of it. <laughs> but I'd like you guys to join me in welcoming these guys to the GGP Zoom studio. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. And everybody, um, Kathleen's bookstore is my favorite bookstore in the whole country. I think it's the best indie. So everyone has to buy Jill's books from Kathleen after. And also buy Jandy's books. <laughs> and the sky's everywhere. And I have all of them. They're fantastic. Um, I'm so and I can say, Jill, we've got all of your books too. Yeah, there they are. Because you know what a what an Uber fan I am. <laughs> your store is phenomenal, and you are phenomenal. And thank you so much. It's Aww. the best bookstore. Always really, it's book. the best bookstore. Always it's like a community. It's the community center. It's the most loving place. I I adore it. So well, you know, we actually love our customers. We kind of consider them family and I hire most of them. Most of my employees <laughs> used to be customers. So that, that's a good thing and a bad thing, but you know, <laughs> um, I am really lucky. I can't believe the amount of support I've had from the writing community and our GGP community this year. Um, I am blown away. Okay, I'm so happy. And I'm very lucky. But we're not here to talk about me. Let's talk about you guys. Okay. Well, I want to talk about Jill's book because I love oh, it. Oh, let's talk about Jill's book. So much. I read all your books. This is my favorite. It did make me ugly cry. Um, I, I, it, for me, it felt really special. Like it felt, it's so intimate and romantic and like deep and emotionally true. And I felt like, I, I mean, Jill and I, disclosure we're good friends <laughs> and I felt like I was on the phone with you and you were like just like late at night and you were just telling me this story you know it just felt so intimate like and it's a beautiful thing to be able to do in a book it's really gorgeous and I felt like it's full of like love and hope and a kind of roadmap for not making choices out of fear and pain but out of love and passion, I'm gonna to start to cry again, <laughs> and like how to live an authentic life. And, and it's funny, like this whole, like that a book can have a very generous spirit. I felt like this book has a very big heart and a very generous spirit and I felt really embraced by it. So that's, was my take. I loved it. It was beautiful. So much. That means so much to me, especially coming from you because when I read, I'll give you the sun, I, I mean, I was sobbing and I finished it and I was like, no one ever has to ever write a book again because oh, this no. is the most perfect no. book in the whole world. No. Truly, I was like, Thank maybe you. I should just stop because Jandy is <laughs> no, so no. book is so perfect. So no, no, no. But let's talk about your book. So, do you want? I was wondering if you wanted to. Do you want to read a, like a little bit, like a page, even just? Yeah, sure. Nobody's asked me that yet, but I'm happy to do it. So we have a little. Does I, only if you want to? It'd yeah, be nice. I'll just read the prologue, which is pretty short. Mm -hmm. um, oh, it's very short. I forgot how short the prologue is. It's very short. Um, maybe I should read a little more than prologue. Um, okay. Maybe this will help. Maybe I won't think about you anymore, dream about you. Maybe I won't have to keep wondering, always wondering, were you even real? 
Should I stop there? Should I keep going? Let me read a few more paragraphs. Okay. A few more paragraphs. As she walked down Astor Place toward her office, Emily Gold rested her hand on her abdomen, trying to figure out if it felt different, if there was something new in there, a constellation of cells that would grow as she did, would end up as a tiny person with deep brown eyes like Ezra or wavy auburn hair like her. Emily hadn't known she wanted a baby until she met Ezra. Then the idea of creating a child with him of having another person living in this world who had his intelligence, his compassion running through their veins. It seemed like something she would have to do, the way she had to breathe, to blink, to swallow. And once she wanted it, once she knew it had to happen, she became immediately afraid that it wouldn't, that she couldn't. The fact that they put it off for a couple of years didn't help. Ezra had wanted to get a promotion first, a raise, an apartment, to make sure they'd be able to give this child everything they possibly could. Now, the time was right. They'd been trying for seven months, months of hope and anticipation and disappointment. And now she was late, only by a day, but still, every hour made it feel more real, more possible. I love that. So great. I mean, it's so this wasn't gonna be my first question, but since you read that, um, I wanted to talk about it because I feel like you really delve into, you know, the law, miscarriage and loss, and I don't want to give spoilers and, and that mad desire to have a baby. And like, um, I feel like there, it's sort of taboo a lot of the time in novels. Like I, I've experienced both, you know, and it's, it was really validating and made me feel really just happy to, to have you just really go deep into what it's like, you know, what, what these losses are like. I feel like there is a very secret loss for most people that and not talked about. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, that's why I wrote about it because I, a few years ago, I had um, a number of friends who over the course of two or three years had had miscarriages and I was talking to them about it. And one of the things that they all seem to have said was how isolating and alone and lonely it felt and that society made it feel like it was taboo or shameful or that there was you know some something wrong in talking about it which there's absolutely not mm. um, and I thought you know if I can write a book that feels true where a woman has a miscarriage that maybe there are people who would read this book and feel less alone. And I always feel like stories to me are really connection points. Mm -hmm. And I wanted this story, this, this piece of the story to be a connection point for women. Um, you know, I remember years ago, a friend of mine who was nine weeks pregnant said to me, um, we were having lunch and she said, I want to tell you that I'm nine weeks pregnant and I know I'm not supposed to tell you now, but if something goes wrong, I want to be able to count on you. Oh. And I thought like, oh my gosh, yeah. that's why people don't tell because then they would have to tell if something went wrong. And that seems so backwards. Like, of course you want your support network there for you. Yeah. Completely. And society has created this scenario in which that often doesn't happen yeah yeah and I I felt like the way you dealt with the loss too it's because I don't think for some reason it's acknowledged in society the real grief that you feel after a miscarriage I think it's you know people are like well you get over it and it's actually really profound and I love the way Emily um deals with it and and explores it and the grief is is just, I, th I thought you did it, it was really wonderful. And also that mad passion to have a baby and how hard it is month after month after month after month. I don't see that much, that in um, novels much either. I mean, and that's, my husband and I were trying to get pregnant while I was writing this novel. Yeah. And so so a lot of that month after month, I was like, oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> you were there. But I was right there. But um, I actually, I actually found out that I was pregnant the week I handed in the uh, edits for this oh. book. Oh, Jill, that's so, so beautiful. That's so wonderful. Okay. That I feel then, like it's almost like there, this book is very special in in like ways that I said, but also like it, there's something. It feels like a blessing. The book. 
maybe like that you you know you got pregnant right after you handed in I really like that because it feels like if there's a little bit of baby magic happening right. I had to get it off my chest and then <laughs> exactly it's really wonderful all right so I want to ask you a question because I what I also thought was really terrific about the book was the structure I think that it's it's it was very simple but it was so effective and so you have um you're, you're telling two stories of love and loss at the same time. And one, um, so I have to put on my glasses because I'm totally blind. And so one is like from the present forward, one from the past, which catches up to the present story. And this is all, and that's one's in an epistolary form. And it's like, it, that sounds very complicated, but it's so simple the way you did it. And I just found that incredibly effective. And I'm really curious, how you did it like did you how'd you come up with a structure did you write both stories together or separately um and did you know one would be a letter a journal kind of letters um form and did you know who that letter would be to in the beginning okay um okay there's a lot of parts to this <laughs> <I know. laughs> well, um so i i always knew i wanted to tell both stories simultaneously and I always knew that I wanted the past story when Emily is like 19, 20 in college to be a first person with a second person address. Mm -hmm. So I knew that, cause I, I always feel like the teenage years and, and college years, there's something very first person about them. Yeah, I really, um, cause there's everything so urgent kind yeah, of. Yeah. Like, I don't know, focused. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and I knew I wanted that address. I wanted her to be talking to someone, um, kind of telling her story. And I initially wasn't sure, like I, I didn't initially have it in sort of journal form, which is what it ended up as. But that, that, that piece of it kind of came later, but I knew that like there was a reason she was talking to someone and I just wasn't sure what it was until I started writing. Um, did you know who the someone would be? I don't want to give it away for the yeah, audience. You I knew, did. okay. I mm -hmm. did. Um, and then in the like current timeline part, I knew that was going to be third person um, because I wanted, I, I wanted the layers of her to be able to be explored a bit more because she was older and she'd been through a lot more and. And there was just more that I wanted to be able to mine. Mm -hmm. um, and I also wanted it to feel very different so that you knew which story you were in and it wasn't confusing at all because similar things happen at different points. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted it to be very clear where you were. Um, and then I knew that I wanted the past to take over the present in the middle of the book. Yeah, that was incredible. It was, you did that so, I was like, holy shit, this is so good structurally. <laughs> Because yeah, you get to that point and you're like, oh my God, this is perfect. It's amazing. So I, yeah, so I wove it in so that the past pieces are short and get longer and longer yeah. and then get shorter and shorter again. And the present starts out long, gets shorter and gets longer so that she kind That's of- That's how you did it. I didn't notice that. Interesting. So she, she, she starts out in one place and then the past kind of changes her in the middle and she comes out somewhere else. Mm. Um, Am I missing parts of the question? Yeah, one, the one part I'm also curious is, so did you write the two stories simultaneously or one first and then the other, or how did you do it? I wrote them simultaneously. Mm -hmm. um, it, that must've been hard actually. You know, I wanted them to fit together really well. And I felt like the only way I could do that is if I knew what was happening in the other story at the same time mm -hmm. so that they could kind of dovetail. But then you, as you're writing it, need to know what's happening in both. In both I mean, that, yeah. yeah, sort of keep them both in my head. That's a lot. Yeah. I referenced back a lot. I was like, wait, what happened the last time we were here? Where right. were we? Oh, that's interesting that you did it that way. I love that. Um, well, it was very well done. I thought that was a really incredible structure and perfect, perfect for the story. It's one of those, you know, when that happens, when it's just like, this is the perfect structure to tell this. So it was amazing. Um, uh, da, da, da. Okay, so I have a question. So I don't have um, more than words here with me, but I have the light we lost. 
Jill's first book. And then it was More Than Words, which you see in her background. And then this one, er Everything After. So I feel a little bit like you wrote a trilogy. <laughs> Am I the only one that feels this way? Like the, it's like kind of like an emotional trilogy or a thematic trilogy. And I don't know, I mean, I have a lot of questions about that, um, but I don't know if you wanted to dis discuss that because there's definite elements of Emily being a more mature Lucy and how Lucy and I forgot the main character's name in um, Nina. Lena? Nina. Nina. Yeah. So Nina and Lucy, it's like when they're are a little bit younger. And so they make choices that it's almost like, um, I guess at that stage, it's sort of like you choose the person who allows you to be your authentic self. Whereas in this more mature sort of with this more mature main character, she realizes that um, it's not so much who you choose, it's who you choose to be yourself. And it felt really like, to me, like a real culmination of a trilogy, like that this woman, incarnation of this woman finally got to this point where she's like, I need to be my authentic self and bring that to whoever I'm with in this way. It was kind of beautiful, like yeah. looking at these three books together. Do you think, how was that for you? Yeah, think? I mean, I, I I, guess I I never thought of them quite as a trilogy, but I see what you're saying completely. <laughs> and also what I sort of thought about was in The Light We Lost, you know, I, ex I explore love and loss in all the books. And in The Light okay. We Lost, it's love and loss as it relates to kind of a romantic partner. Mm -hmm. And then more than words, it's love and loss as it relates to parents. Mm -hmm. And then- in this book, it's love and loss initially as it relates to children, but then also as it relates to yourself. Yes. If you lose yourself, how do you, you have to love yourself to find yourself again. And I think in, in this last one, that's kind of what Emily does. She, she has to figure out how to love herself again and, and figure out who she is. I know, I felt like, I really felt like her journey was very authentic for all of us to figure out how to be yourself in this world and how to have a creative self and how to have, be in a relationship and have a creative self. I mean, it really did feel, um, it, was, it was really wonderful. So she, um, when the book opens, um, Emily is a therapist. And I thought that was an interesting choice because it also allows you to your character to be very self emotionally emotionally self aware, mm -hmm. and 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 also very kind of psychologically accurate about the people around her. Um, what did what, did you find that that I mean how was that having a character who was a therapist? Um, I I liked it for Emily because I felt like she she was able to understand what she was doing. And even though she sometimes knew it wasn't like the right thing to do, <laughs> she she understood why she was doing it anyway. Right. Um, and I feel like sometimes like for her, it just, it felt like she explaining that it was why she was doing something for this book kind of made her a little more, um, I guess like approachable or, or likable or something like that than someone who just kind of makes these decisions without really being able to process why they're making them. Yeah, I found it, I, I it made me love her. It definitely makes her more lovable, but also I also found it interesting as for as a writer to be able to have a character like that because often you're not allowed to have your character be so self-aware or because maybe people aren't as self-aware usually <laughs> it was kind of great um so one of the thing that really stuck in my mind a lot and I don't know why was the, the whole concept of being a sin eater do you want to tell everybody what that is and because I thought yeah. it was so interesting so it's um from I think like medieval times ish where if there, there was this person in town who, when somebody died, they would make a meal and the meal would represent all of the sins that the person who died had committed in their life. 
And this person would have to eat that meal and would be eating their sins so that the person who died could have a lovely afterlife in heaven. Um, and, and the do, person, do people have that job? Was it a job that, or was it a family member? Like, no, it was a job and it was like a look down upon job. Like if you were the sin eater, that wasn't a good job to have. <laughs> did you take on, did sin eater take on the sins for real? I think so. Oh my God. I think they like, it really, became their, their soul their, or something. Yeah. Wow. That's intense. So, um, Emily, I mean, I think that was the moment where you kind of realized maybe she doesn't like her job too much, right? <laughs> you know? Um, so I wanted to ask you something else. So there's a, a system of belief in the novel there that comes up with the mother, um, I guess Rob's mother and Emily's mother. Rob's mother, was she the one, she said, everything is going to be okay. And in the end, and so and it's, it's not, not okay, okay. It's, it's not the end. end. And then Emily's mother said, what was it again? If, if um, everything happens the way it's supposed to, was that right? right? Yeah. yeah. And so it's a heavily kind of faded theme running through the book about fate and destiny and stuff like that. And I wondered about that. Like I wondered, cause there are certain themes in books of mine that I don't necessarily believe in, but the book believes in. And so I was curious if, if what that was, if how you feel about that sort of fate and destiny. Yeah, I, you know, I feel like I I struggle with fate and destiny in all three of my books. Like, <laughs> is it fate or free will is the main question that underlies the light we lost. You know, are they together because they were meant to be together or because they chose to be together? Yeah. Um, and I don't fully know where I fall on the question, which is maybe why I keep writing about it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I... And what I was doing with the, both the mothers was sort of there that that um, Rob's mother kind of had this, I guess, more optimistic take on it that like, whatever the bad part is, we just have to get through it. And there's going to be a good part at the end. Like, that's just how things work. It will be okay in the end. And then I was thinking, well, if you tell yourself that enough, you will look for the good thing at the end that someone else might not see as a good thing, you know, cause you're always looking for the better part, you know? Right. I love that. And then Emily's mom who just said everything happens the way it's supposed to, like there isn't a value judgment on that. So like if a crappy thing happens, it's supposed to be crappy. And that's, and so it's more of an acceptance. Mm -hmm. It's just like, accept how things are. And um, I kind of, I guess I kind of feel like maybe for me, I smush those things in my life. Like I accept that this is how things are, but also if this is how things are, then let's make the best out of it that we can, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. I love that. Definitely made it makes you it made me feel good reading your book too because it's very optimistic, you know. Sometimes I wonder my books also have a lot of, of destiny in them, and I wonder some. I, I started wondering recently if it becomes such a part of your plot or your you know when you're writing a novel because in some ways destiny is plot. Plot is dest right. I mean we're we're creating something where. We're it's giving the characters their destiny. Exactly. So I think that you're kind of dealing with it on meta level as well as just with the characters, you know. But I, I really love that part of the book that they both were grappling with it, you know, and it felt really real to me. Um, so I have all these questions. I just want to make sure we don't miss. I don't want to miss a good one. Um, oh yeah. So Emily makes a lot of choices, as we all do, and I wondered if she surprised you ever or did you know what she was going to do like because there's some choices she makes I was like whoa and it was great I was so happy but I wondered if you as a writer experienced that surprise too um so the first the first version of this book was substantially shorter and there was a whole chunk at the end that just wasn't there and I was like there's something very missing with this book like mm -hmm. a it's just too short but b like there is something very missing here 
And I stretched out um, part of a section and then I was like, oh, she goes away. Okay, yeah, um, that, that's, that's what then, I'm talking about, yeah. Yeah, that's what I figured you were talking about. Um, and, and I guess that it wasn't what I intended initially to happen in the book, but it, it just felt like what she needed to do at that point in time for the story to feel full. Yeah. Um, and then once that happened, I actually changed the end initially. And it, the outcome was entirely different. And then I decided I didn't like that ending, but I did still like that she went away. So I flipped the ending back to what I initially thought it was going to be. Um, oh my God, I want to know, but I can't ask you because I don't want to like, spoil there's, it. There was a lot, there was a lot sort of at the end where I, I, I really wasn't sure for a while how this book was going to end because there were so many ways it could have. And I kind of liked a few different options, but then I was sort of thinking, all right, what do I want to say with this book? Let me think about that a little bit. And, and what would I be saying if it ended this way or this way or this way? I was, a part of me thought it was going to end a different way and I'm happy it ended the way it did. I felt like because in some ways I felt like if thinking about your oof as like, <laughs> I like that she made maybe a different choice than your other yeah. narrators did, which I liked. I think thought that was really interesting and great. And I'm not gonna say any more about that because I don't want to spoil it for everybody. <laughs> this is the best part. Um, so, oh, so we haven't even gotten into this, but this book is a lot about being a, like rock star basically like a real real rock star and being a musician um and I want first of all I loved your songs I thought they were really good thank you and I wondered like how did you know how to write a song was it like did it just come <laughs> it did I do I don't know how to write a song um but I I did a lot of musical stuff when I was a kid I'm not talented I'm not good I'm really not good <laughs> but I loved it mm -hmm. um so there was a lot of music in my life, particularly in like high school. Um, I played, you know, the flute in the marching band. I oh, sang in so like, yeah, <laughs> corral, like whatever. I, there was a lot of music. So I, I think I innately kind of a little bit understood, like how to go about songs ish. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of as like there's one part where Emily is writing a song throughout a couple of chapters and I was kind of actually writing that song as Emily's oh, writing that right. song and I was like oh this this is kind of feels funny sounds funny I have to change this part I have to change that part I have to get the motion right or whatever but I just kind of kept the different iterations in and and you know they were Emily working to get through a song. I really, I loved that because I actually felt like that was felt really natural. And like, I actually thought then the song, I was like, oh, it actually came out great. Great job, <laughs> Emily. <laughs> yeah, right. um, and and um, super fun thing is that a friend of mine from high school who actually is a phenomenally talented musician. And when I told her I was doing this, she said to me, do you have the song? Like, could you sing the song in your head? Do you have a melody line? And I said, yeah, I do. And she said, all right, if you send me a voice note, I'll write the music. Oh my God, so we have this? Crystal Castle, I do, for Christa, <gasps> Crystal Castle and Everyone But Me, one of Rob's songs, one of Emily's songs. Yeah. Um, she wrote the music and then she recorded Emily's song and she plays the piano beautifully. So she did that one and she got a friend of hers, um, a guy who plays the guitar to record Rob song. So we have the recordings of both of them. Oh my God. Can we hear them yeah. now? Or is that, um, I, I don't know how to play. Are they on your website? They're not on my website. They're in, I'm starting a newsletter. It's going to go oh, out great. March 20th for spring oh, and they're going to be in the newsletter. So everyone yeah. sign up for Jill's newsletter, wherever you do that. I don't know. Where, would, where would we There's do that? There's a page that says newsletter and you can sign up. You on your it. website? Yeah. But I'll okay. send it to you after this, Jandy. Okay, good. <laughs> All right. Um, so I want to, so I have some more just curious questions that I'm always curious about with you. So Jill is this amazing editor, as everybody knows. And I wanted to, how do you feel about, do you feel like you, about editing yourself? Do you feel like it helps you edit yourself? 
I think it does. Um, I mean, I, I obviously need an editor and a writer's group and like a million people read my books before they become books because I could never do it by myself. Um, you know, my agent, my, a ton of experts, like literally a billion people. Um, but I think that because I have so much practice editing other people's work, I can look at my own work and say, oh, this is actually similar to something that I commented to someone else on. Mm -hmm. I should kind of use that, use my own advice here and fix this, you know? Right. Um, Cause it's just something that I've been doing literally for almost 20 years. So there, there's just a muscle that I can exercise on my own stuff too. But there, is, there are definitely times where I'm just too close or I just, I know what I mean. So I don't necessarily pick up that that's not coming through. Right, right, I can see that. Well, I think um, th like for this book to me feels just so, um, there's not an extra word. Like I felt like it's so well edited. Like I almost felt like I wondered, like it almost, you know, it's the best, it's the kind of book where you're like, this just came out like this. She just, you know what I mean? Like I said, <laughs> it didn't, it didn't, like you were just talking to me, you know, it, it's, it has that effortless, effortlessness to it. And um, I, for me, I know that anything that seems effortless in art usually is so like was just a tremendous struggle. So how was this process compared to other books that you've written? This one actually was a bit easier than More Than Words. Um, that was probably the hardest book that I've written so far of the three. And the the no extra words in there, This that's probably um, thanks to Tara St. Carlson, my editor, who is <laughs> phenomenal. Um, and uh, makes me makes me look really good. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, Tara. Yay, editors. Um, but yeah, this book, you know, I it was one of those books that I just I just knew what I wanted to write. I mean, I didn't know the end, but other than that, I kind of knew what this book was, and it didn't take me very long to know Emily. And I think in part because I was writing her past and her present and they were so intertwined, like I I really knew her. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny, there's this, you know, Emily, it's, it's interesting because Emily is bifurcated, right? She has kind of suppressed her whole past. So we're getting to know her, but she's a very different person um, now. And it, there's this incredible moment. I don't know if, I don't know if I, this is giving away too much. If it is, just tell me to shut up. But there's a moment where people in her life now don't know that she has this musical background. Can I still talk about that? Yeah. Because I think yeah. that's a call. So she's at a party with her husband and all these people in her life. And she starts playing piano and she's like a virtuoso and the whole room just is, you know, shocked and just freaking out how amazing she is. And, but her husband is like, I didn't know this about you. I mean, it's kind of wild that someone could have that inside them. I mean, what was that like writing that a character like that? That's it's almost like she has the biggest secret ever. Her whole personality is a secret. Right. Her whole everything is a secret. Yeah. You know, I I think that she, she there there was um, a, a a bit in the book that I that I wrote, and when I thought of it, I thought this is this is exactly what I want this book to feel like where I talk about um, a knot in the chain of a necklace. Mm. And there, you know, for anyone who's tried to get knots out of the chain of a necklace, right? It's sometimes you can get them out. And sometimes there's this one knot that like, you're not gonna be able to get out of the necklace. So your choice is either like you get rid of the necklace or you just kind of pull that knot really, really tight. So it gets <laughs> as small as possible. And then you wear it in the back of your neck and you're fine, right? <laughs> And I feel like that's kind of what Emily did. Like she, she had this really painful experience and anything that was around that painful experience, anything that was involved in it at all, she just kind of like pulled really tight in a knot and like stuck it in the back of her neck. And she's like, we're fine. We're fine. You can't see it. Yeah, you know, yeah. 
And the only way she was able to wear that necklace or survive really um, without dealing with that pain again was by just not ever talking about the fact that there is a knot in the necklace in the back of her head, you know? And then the only way she's really able to heal is to be like, hey guys, there's this knot here. <laughs> like, can right. you help? Maybe right. you can help me undo it, right? right? right. And it's not right. until she's really, um, she's really able to confront that, that she's able to heal. Like the thing that she's repressed is the thing she needs to heal from the thing that she's repressing. Right, completely. It's such a good metaphor for Emily. That is, it's like perfect. You know, all right, I have to, I know we're gonna open it up to questions for other people, but I just wanna make sure that I didn't miss like the most important question. Oh, do you wanna talk about the title? I really love the title. And I have to tell you what it reminds me of. It reminds me of, there's this book, I can't remember who wrote it, something like After the Ecstasy, The Laundry. <laughs> it's like a Buddhist book or something like, and I love that. It kind of reminded me, I love it, everything after. So it's, and the book is really that. It's like, this is, so how, how, did that, how, did, how do your titles come to you and how did this one? So this one in particular, um, I wanted it to have a sort of music allusion to it. And there's this Counting Crows album, August and Everything After. Oh, nice which I loved listening to when I was in high school. And I initially, Emily's name was April and it didn't fit her. So I changed it, but I had originally in my head called the book April and everything after. And I was like, oh, it's a month that like works so well. It's so cute. Um, <laughs> and then when her name was Emily, Emily and everything after sounds stupid. So I just called it everything after. Um, and it kind of stuck, but I think it, it like really feels to me like what the book is. It's like this thing happened and this is everything that happened afterward. Like, and it was that point in her life that like, it's like before and after, you know? It's funny that you say that because in my mind, I went somewhere else completely. Like I thought um, happily ever after. And this is like sort of after the happily ever after in a way, like, somehow like um in in a many different ways do you know i don't know that's 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 what i where i was went with it um, I that too so um kathleen do you want should we open up to questions or should i i have a million yeah, I, I have a question too um i really liked her relationship with her sister ari yes and i know that you like me are one of three sisters and um do you think that just that bond was so important. I thought it was important to keep the book on a on a more intimate level. Yeah. yeah. Um yeah, I loved writing that relationship and I I felt like Emily needed someone to trust. She needed someone to be her rock. She needed someone that she could go to and for me that's always been my sister. So I felt like she should have a sister that she can feel that way about too, especially because so much in her childhood was all, you know, sad and weird. So like that, that having that person there who knew her forever and it was always there for her, I thought was really important. Um, but then also I loved that as the book went on, you saw that that relationship kind of changed a little bit and Emily could be there for Ari when Ari needed her, which, you know, kind of feels like it's new for them and is, is a new way that Emily kind of sees the world now or exists in the world. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just, I really love that, that dynamic that you wrote. I mean, it, I, as a matter of fact, right before I got on this call, I was talking to my sister. <laughs> <laughs> you were talking about paint colors because that's how exciting my life is. Oh my God. Uh, you call me. I'm obsessed with talking about paint colors. I'll have to call you, Jen. I'm painting my house. I'm going to paint mine too. That's why. <laughs> um, so uh, we've got a couple questions here. We've got one from Evie Hoff who says, um, what is your favorite part of the writing process and what's easiest for you or what is most satisfying to conquer and complete? Hmm. I, I think you can both take that one. Oh. <laughs> I know I'm a dirtbag. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think for me, the hardest part is the first draft. Yeah. The, 
easier part is revision once I kind of know what's going on. Um, and I think when I can get to the end of a first draft and feel like, all right, at least I have something here I can work with, that to me feels like, okay, this is a relief. There is There are words, there's a story, there are characters, things happen. Now I can actually like work with this and make it something that I like. I feel very much the same, to be honest. Like for me, um, there's my favorite part absolutely is the late, late drafts because I just want to just tinker and I would really like to just tinker for another three years. <laughs> but before that, it's hard. <laughs> okay, we've got another question for Jill. How has your drafting and writing process changed from the light we lost to everything after? And what have each of your novels taught you about writing and what brings out the best stories the, and the things you question and want to explore? And I'm not sure who wrote, who is the person behind that question, but it's a good one. <laughs> yeah. um, so The Light We Lost, I wrote in vignettes, not initially intending for it to be a novel. And it just kind of developed initially when I was trying to write myself a friend, really. Yeah. Um, and who was the friend? Then, the main character was Nina the I um, was Lucy the friend yeah mm -hmm. um that way I could stop bothering my real life friends about how upset I was about a breakup I was like they've heard enough of me I, I need to invent my own friend to talk to so that you know we can have conversations and I can stop bothering everybody else um so so that book I mean it took me a long time to to sort of finish because it started and then it became a novel and then I kind of had to shape it and then I revised it a bunch of times and um so I think I mean from that one I think I just kind of learned the shape of a novel like how to how to actually kind of shape a story um and more than words literally I think there's a paragraph from the first draft of more than words that's in the final book and that might be it and that one, I really wow. just started over more or less from scratch, like an, at least once, if not twice, mm -hmm. or at least once for like the beginning and twice for the end or something like that. That book changed a lot. And um, I think with that one, I, I kind of learned how to just let go and say like, all right, if this, if this doesn't feel like it's working, stop trying to make it work. Just, just start over. It's fine. You can, you, you have like a practice training wheels draft and that's okay. And take what you like. And if there's nothing you like, that's okay. You don't have to take that either. Um, or just take the ideas of it. So did, did the characters remain or this? They the, shifted like a lot. I mean, what they did shifted Tim, who is Nina's boyfriend, he initially was not her boyfriend. He was just her best friend and he was a professor. And there's that um, section where Raphael talks about people being poems. And initially that was something that Tim said, like it's everything just kind of right. moved around and shifted. Um, and then with everything after, it was just a little bit easier. Um, and I don't fully know why, except that maybe I was a little more confident. I don't know. Um, don't you feel, I sort of feel like um, that there are just miracle books that are like that and you get lucky and you just never know when you're gonna get a miracle book or when you're gonna get like the torture book. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably true. It's probably true. Because like, yeah, I feel like when we start to think, oh, I know how to do this, that's when you get the torture book. <laughs> You're like, I don't know how to do this now, even a little. Why did I think I was going to ever do this again? Exactly. Um, and now we've got a question for Jandy. Um, is Jandy's new book coming anytime soon? Mm. Jandy hopes so. <laughs> I hope so. I'm, I'm, I, I'm working on it. And I would say... Yes, I would say pretty soon. 
it's long though. It's very long right now. And I don't know if it's going to continue to be that long, but right now it's, it used to be insanely long. It used to be like um, a thousand pages long. And now it's, I've gotten down to like under, like right under 500. So I don't know what the finish book is going to be, but. Is there a title? I'm not, I can't talk about the title. <laughs> it's a secret. <laughs> But you know what's weird? I don't know if this ever happened to you. So I, I had a bunch of titles and then I came out with this title that I really, really liked. And then an author I really like has a very similar title. And I, you feel like, oh my God, they're going to think I stole their title. And so I have to figure out that. Has that ever happened to you? Like, yeah, yeah there, years ago and it's like, <laughs> yeah. And you're like, oh, but I uh, can't. <laughs> So here's another one for, um, I'm not sure if this is for both of you, but um, have you been approached by TV or movie studios for any of your books? You want to take it, Jill? I can take it, yeah. Um, yes. So uh, The Light We Lost is optioned for film, and I actually had a chance to read the script uh, a month ago, two months ago. And I love it. Um, so I'm great. Well, that keeps moving forward. So so great that you love it. That's incredible yeah. news. That's fabulous. That's it's really it, it made me cry, and I knew what would happen. So like, oh, I was like perfect. I think that book yeah. will be an amazing movie. I really do. And this, yeah, one, I think everything after will be amazing yeah, too. I think because it's, be so that, um, it's such a visual book. I don't yeah. know how many of you have read it, but. Um, as Jill knows, that I'm her number one. I'm, well, Danny knows too. I'm, I'm kind of a stalker. And um, <laughs> I um, I actually sent a note to Jill, both Jill and her editor as soon as I heard this book was coming and, and begged and, and they sent me the manuscript. So I read it the first time quite a, quite a while ago. And, and I think it's what, I think it's your most visual book. I mean, I was right there in, in the clubs. I was on stage with them. You know, I mean, it just, I felt that the book was so immediate. Yeah, I relate, I, I, I think so too. Like there's a scene that comes late that we're not allowed to talk about when she goes away. I like how we're talking about it when she goes away. <laughs> goes away. It's so visual that I can totally see it would be wonderful in a movie. It would be an incredible scene. So, and then fun. we've got a question from Noah. If, if not fully formed and living and breathing, how do characters come to you? Jill, how did Emily come to you? She came to me in, she was, she was mostly formed, I think. Um, I, I, I knew there was a scene with a woman who had had a miscarriage and she was talking to another woman about it. And I, I, and I, I sort of kept thinking about like, who, who is this woman? What, what has happened to her? How has she gotten to this point? Um, so I guess I started really with that scene and then was spinning out in my head. Um, and when she was, when, when there were other, like in earlier, very early iterations of the book, she was slightly different, but then, um, then as this book sort of, sort of grew, she kind of became very much herself. So I think, I think I actually developed the character as I'm building the plot, if that makes sense, that they sort of, when I, when I figure out how a character is going to react to a situation or make a decision, then um, then that sort of adds a layer to them that I can use to build the rest of the book. So in all three of these novels, did your main character come first to you? Yes, I think so. It's sort of like the main character and one scene. Mm -hmm. Like I saw them in one scene and then... That's interesting. Yeah. Now, was Emily always going to be a musician from from day one? Kind of a closeted musician, as she is in the beginning of the book. Pretty early on, pretty early on. 
I have to say that that's what, one of the things that I absolutely loved about the book is it felt so real to me that um, I felt that that Emily was so wonderfully developed from from the minute she appears on the page till the very last line. I, I felt that she was somebody that you could pull out of the book and have a really great conversation with. That Which is to me is my ultimate yeah, compliment. compliment. I want to take the character out of a book and, and just sit them on my couch and talk about the book. Yeah. I feel that way about Emily too. I feel like she could be, she, she could be your best friend for sure. Oh yeah. She'd be somebody you definitely want to hang out with. And Rob too. Can't forget Rob. Oh, I loved Rob. Not that we don't love Ezra too, but um, definitely would like to chill <laughs> with Rob. <laughs> He's great. He'd be more fun night out. Yeah, and Ari, and um, the best friend, or Priya. Priya. Yeah, she's, yeah, yeah, she's also a great character. She, and she was funny too, because she's like, who are you? <laughs> like, what? She, like, she knows her completely differently. And then <laughs> she's like, oh my God. <laughs> which is kind of interesting. I love that. Now, does anybody else have any other questions for Jill or Jamie? Let me see. I mean, I could talk to you guys forever and I need to say I miss you terribly. I miss you terribly, both of you so much. Oh my God. Hugs so much. I have, wait, let me see. Um, can you tell us just some fun stuff? Like, do you, well, see, this is my thing with Jill everybody is Jill is one of these superhuman people that gets more done in a day than like I get done probably in a year um so I would I wondered if you'd tell us what your writing day is like like what and and then if you feel like telling us if you have any weird habits that'd be fun um, <laughs> or superstitions or whatever so so I guess it depends like my writing days really depend like is it a day that I'm doing other work is it a day that I've set aside for writing like there's sometimes I'll go away on like a writing trip and I'll write just like when I've gotten a certain level of momentum in a book I'll just go away and I'll write like all day long mm -hmm. um but sometimes I I'll just be thinking about the book for like you know I mean in this I I started writing again this past March but I had taken a three-month break when my baby was born because my brain wasn't functioning still medium functioning um i think it's functioning pretty well <laughs> um so you know i feel like it it really differs like today i wrote a little bit but i did a bunch of social media stuff but also i went to a local bookstore to sign some books that people had ordered and wanted signed um so it really depends, um, but I do try and give myself goals, either like weekly, daily, monthly, whatever I'm kind of feeling to say, I need to hit this by this point because I do really well with like self-imposed goals. Mm -hmm. um, and I sort of, I, you know, I have one for the end of March that I really hope I can hit, you know? Um, and then I also make dates with my writing group and tell them that I'm gonna get them pages by a certain date so that I know I have to write the pages by the time I have to send them to them. That'd be good, that's good. Yeah, that's good. So I play mind games with myself basically. Like I play mind <laughs> games with myself works. all it the time. It really works, it's great. And, um, and then we've got a question for Jandy. Uh, can you talk about your book process a, a little bit? So your writing process? <laughs> Um, with novel writing, I mean, I, I've recently been writing, um, I wrote a screenplay um, and I've been working on another project too, which is has a, comp a very different from my novel writing process. But with novel writing, I don't know. I just sort of, it's hard for you. Um, with my most recent book, it's just been hard to, I really go for it in the sense of, I just, with this book, it kept turning into more and more books. I would say that there's like four novels within one and I allowed that to happen. I just said, at one point I was just like thinking, okay, this will be my next book and this will be the book after that. And this will be the book after that. But the truth is I wanted it all to be one book. And so I just wrote it all and then figured I would make it work. 
And so that, that's that been the process for this book, but my process has been completely different on every book. Um, but that's this process has been just allowing myself to, to really write everything I want to, and then pray, <laughs> and then cross fingers. <laughs> Does anybody else have a question for Jill or Jandy? I want well, to I, I can't, I I can't want to know tell you guys. guys. Oh, sorry. I was going to ask oh, yeah. what you guys are love besides. So everyone has to buy Jill's book at Kathleen's amazing store and all Jill's books. But have you guys read anything you've loved recently that you can share with us? I have. What? I, I've read a book that I absolutely love. Um, Jill's. Um, it's uh, Songs in Ursa Major, which is coming in June, and it's a fictionalized account of the love affair of Joni Mitchell and James Taylor at the beginning of their career. Oh, that sounds awesome. Who wrote that? Is that the it days? Was, who, who it's it's that? by um, it's by Emma Brody. Uh -huh. Cool. And I I I read it. Then I gave it to one sister. She read it, and then I sent it. I just sent it down to the other sister, and she's reading it now. And then we're all going to talk about it and see what what we liked and didn't like, which is what we do. We do that. We have our, our book group of three sometimes. That's, That's awesome. Oh, so nice. My but brother, there are so many books coming out. Oh, good. I can't I wait. I have one that I loved. I've what? learned it. It's called um, The Nine Lives of Rose Napolitano. I love that oh, book. Cool. I, so I, good, right? That. Is that the day? Oh, it's, wait. It it's by Donna yes. Frady. Oh. Oh, there it is. Um, and it. <laughs> So it's literally the nine possible lives of this one woman if she makes different choices and they're all woven together. Oh my God, that I love that. And like, there are some sections where it's like, rows number one, three, and six have this scene that's the same, but then they make these different choices and then they go off in these different directions. I love that. I've always, I'm, that's like the sliding doors kind of thing. I love that as a device. Sounds yeah, great. It, this book is so good. This is another one that that I'm actually bringing in for one of my staff to read. This is my tile. I have a big pile next to my computer of stuff I have to bring back to the store. Such a good idea. That's great. Um, um, we have a couple okay. more questions. Okay. Uh, well, uh, Lloyd Russell just said he really liked The Extraordinary Life of Sam Hill by Robert Dugoni. Cool. I love that. He said title. it's universally loved. All right, excellent. And Thank then we've, we've got another question from Noah August. Mm -hmm. Another question, would you ever post deleted excerpts from your previous books? Absolutely dying for, some, for more amazing writing. Hmm. Who's it for? I think both of you can take it. Maybe. I mean, with this book, there's so many parts that I had to cut <laughs> that I might. <laughs> it's a whole nother book exactly okay. exactly um, there is a cut scene of everything after that will be on my social media at some point um that uh is from the version where the ending is different oh wow Ooh, I'm dying I to see that. I, yeah after we get off you have, we have to talk privately it's not so much <laughs> to find out what that ending was i'm so curious <laughs> Um, and um, I want to let everybody know that the book plates arrived today, so we will have signed copies of Jill's books, and we um, have Jandy's books, like always. Um, <laughs> and um, this was so much fun, you guys. Oh, it was so nice to see you guys. And I was, I was telling Jill, and I was actually going to just say, let's just turn it over to Laura, who's Jill's new baby, in the beginning, and then we could all look stare at Laura the whole time. I actually heard her downstairs crying. She stopped, but I think she woke up. But um, here, wait, I can show you the, this is what she looks like when she sleeps because she has this hilarious like little suit that she wears. I can't stand it. She's the prettiest <laughs> like baby. So it, just, it makes me smile so much, her and her like little like, ah. So cute. Little squirrel. And she also looks so wide awake, which is, seems apropos. <laughs> totally. She doesn't really think very much. Um, so is everyone doing okay in the pandemic you guys both of you I mean not work-wise but just life-wise is everyone hanging in there I miss hugs oh god cannot wait can't I wait you. I miss seeing yeah. 
strangers smile on the street. Yes. Really? You know, it's funny. I've had these situations recently where I've had to meet people in person that I had never met before. And it's really different trying to connect with someone when their whole face is covered. It's yeah. really different. I met someone in DC who came to an event, um, I guess on Tuesday night, the Zoom event that I had. And she texted me afterward and she's like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize until just now that I've never seen the bottom half of your face before. <laughs> <laughs> so wild so just so wild what we've all been experiencing and it feels doesn't it feel like it's coming to an exciting conclusion that we're going to be back to so. hugging and I having fun so. and, Jinx it. yeah i'm okay knocking wood has anybody gotten vaccinated yet no I'm dying to cannot wait same just I registered but i don't qualify yet i just i tr said i would volunteer did you kathleen no not yet oh we're so close soon. Well, I am so excited. I can't wait to see you in person again, Jill, someday. And I can't wait, wait to meet baby Laura. Me too. I know we want to come to California. We want to hang with you. I can't wait. We'll, we'll to... go out to dinner when it when we can again. Yes. We're going to go out to dinner. I, just, that I haven't seen. This is the longest I've gone without seeing Jandy in person since. I know. Uh, the Sky is Everywhere came out. Oh and that's God. a lot of years ago. <laughs> That's incredible. And Jill, I haven't seen you since your wedding. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. And I saw you guys, what, six weeks before you got married, eight weeks before. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That, that's... And I got to meet Andrew this time though. I, I think never met last... Andrew. I think that's the last time I've seen you, Kathleen, too, was then. No, was I think we saw one, one time after with uh, Gail. Oh, right. <laughs> Right. Well, I think I'm I'm hope, holding out for another roaring twenties. So when we see each other, we can all we're gonna have to drink drinks, <laughs> have fun, <and> dance <laughs> on tables. Cheers! <laughs> Cheers to that. Okay. Well, Jill, I love well, you. everybody. I want to I want to let you know that um, we do have lots of Jill's and Jandy's books in stock, and you can buy them online at www ggpbooks.com or we are open for browsing which is super exciting but you do have to wear a mask and wear and do sanitizer um but jill and jandy thank you guys so much thank i hope you, you guys know how much i love you so and i've oh. missed you both terribly we love you too and i cannot wait to go to your bookstore and be there in person and buy books and go to readings in person and see you again and give you a big hug and jill i cannot wait to meet laura too much. I can't wait to meet Laura either. God, I'm so excited. We're once we're all vaccinated, we're just gonna fly everywhere. We're just gonna go. You'll have to come to our housewarming party. Nina and I, when it, both of you, once things are better, we'll have the real housewarming party. Do you know that Nina and I bought a house, Kathleen? I do. Yeah. yeah. So we'll have a party. Nina told me right when she was going over, she stopped by. That was the last time I saw Nina. She was stopping by right before the shutdown. Um, to sign books and um, she told me that she was going over to sign the papers it's crazy no we did it we, yeah, we bought it on. and then everything shut down it was nuts but anyway now we're gossiping <laughs> <laughs> I forget I forget that there are people watching <laughs> <laughs> all right love you guys congratulations Jill your book is beautiful you. I hope everybody buys it, Jill, and thank it you and so much for writing yeah. this book yeah. I absolutely loved it and I don't, Jandy, I think you've got my phone number. If you could send it, Jill, I want to hear the song too. Yeah. Okay. All right, you guys. So you, you guys, thank you so much. So much. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Okay. Lots of love. Thank you to everyone. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Michael. Yes, thank you, Michael. Thanks.